everyone. Welcome to Looking to the East. I'm Dr. Zerker. I'm coming from Kobe, Japan this morning for our webcast. I want to introduce my very special guest for this show. Uh, the show, we're going to be looking at Japanese history and how it can inform us, educate us about what happened on January 6th in the United States. So my very special guest today is also a professor at Kansai Gaide, like myself. So Dr. Taro Tsuda, he's a graduate from Harvard University in Japanese history in 2019. So he's a new professor at Kansai Gaide. He's just completed his first year of study. Uh, Taro had focused on the post-World War II period uh, in Japan, uh, but he has expertise also on the topic that we're going to talk about today. <clears throat> and uh, that topic is, uh, comes from an article that I read uh, a couple of weeks ago. Paul Krugman, who I follow, the uh, liberal economist and New York Times uh, opinion writer, has a blog. And in his blog, there was a listing uh, from Noah Smith. So if you're interested in this topic after you view the show and want to go to the source information, just Google Noah Smith. He has a blog called No Opinion. And uh, there was an entry there that Krugman had noted called Japanese Lessons for the American Coup. And uh, I had vaguely remembered in my studies <clears throat> that uh, there was a period of time before World War II where there was a series of Japanese coups that occurred. And the article or the blog pointed out that there were actually five. And they were uh, by right wing uh, military members attempting to take over the government and move it in a different direction. And uh, the focus of the article is taking a look at what happened there and seeing how it could potentially apply to what we observed uh, earlier this month in the United States, where we had right wing elements also try and uh, undermine the democratic process of transition of presidency from Trump over to um, the current president, President Biden. So that's our topic today. It's to take a look at what happened in the 1930s with a series of military coups and what lessons we can learn from that that potentially we can apply to how to manage the coup that occurred in the United States, the first one in over 200 years. The, first, uh, the, the previous one was the War of 1812 where the British actually invaded. It was the foreigners who came in and took over the Capitol building. This time it was Americans who did it. So, Taro, thank you so much for uh, participating uh, in our humble uh, webcast today and looking to the east. Really appreciate it. Um, I think uh, I'd like to start with uh, looking at that period of time, the 1930s, and uh, why there was a series of coups that occurred. And uh, maybe if you would uh, highlight one of them so our viewers can understand what was going on in Japan at that time. Sure, uh, thank you very much for having me and for this opportunity. Um, so I, I found the article very uh, interesting and um, it's a fascinating topic. Um, I think uh, um, it might seem kind of counterintuitive because uh, the Japanese case before World War II is is a completely different time period, a completely different place, very distant from the US, very different cultural and geographic uh, context. But actually I think that um, because, because it se is a, seems like it's a very different case, you can actually learn a lot of interesting things from the similarities or parallels that exist with between Japan in that time period and the US more currently. And so there are a lot of important differences, but also some very fascinating parallels um, that I kind of noticed, so. Yeah, um, so what was the context in the 1930s? Why, I mean, it's quite remarkable. Uh, you know, you, you think of military coups as occurring in, in third world countries, you know, in maybe Africa or in Latin America, and there'd be a series of them, one after the other. But the fact that there were five of them uh, during a, a one decade in Japan, what what were the conditions that, that led to these coups? What was going on there? 
Well, I think um, there are several um, important background conditions to highlight. First of all, um, in Japan in the early 20th century had already on, undergone a lot of modernization and industrialization. So in many ways, it was different from the US at the, the current situation in the US, but um, it was very much already a um, modernizing and pluralistic society. So there were, um, uh, the, it was basically the jazz age. It was the age of very intense urbanization and industrialization, especially after World War I. And so I think the tensions that, that um, were unleashed by this process were very responsible for the, um, the right-wing nationalism that led to the, the coups. So um, a, a growing gap between urban and rural Japan, as well as um, uh, sort of uneven development. This was the time right after the depression had started the worldwide Great Depression, which had hit Japan very heavily as well, since mm. um, trade and uh, trade was really much um, trade barriers were raised by various countries. This hurt Japanese industry and the economy very much. And so the, the, um, the place that was hurt the most was the countryside in Japan. This was the area which uh, supplied a lot of the soldiers, the sort of rank and file soldiers in the Japanese army. And so, ah, so uh, the military, the Japanese military at that time was mostly made up of rural people, non-urban exactly. people. That, that's actually similar to the U.S. military as well, uh, since the voluntary military system has been put in now for decades. Interesting. And your point about the economic tension in the country, I think that also has some similarities with the United States right now with income inequality and uh, certainly with the COVID crisis and how unemployment rates have really hit high levels. I mean, almost as high as the depression, as you mentioned. So these soldiers who were doing the coup, I read that they were, they were not high level. They were mostly low level, like colonel level or who, who were these people who were, who were leading the series of military coups against the Japanese government? And, and I guess, what were they trying to accomplish? Um, so they were, uh, they're often known as the junior officers um, in, in uh, Japanese history. So they were sort of lower to medium rank uh, uh, officers. And um, a lot of them were within the path that, that um, were not going to reach the, the most elite levels. And so it was a kind of two tiered system where there was a very elite level of uh, military officers and a lower level. And so they, the, the elite were, guys were coming out of University of Tokyo or high level schools and stuff? Or the top military academies in, oh, I in see. Japan. And then there were the lower um, military educational institutions. So mm. um, these were people who were not going to probably reach the top levels, most of them at least. And so there was, I guess, a limit to the uh, level, amount they could, they could rise, as well as the fact that um, they were very shaped by the conditions in the countryside where, where they had come from. And so uh, uh, there were a lot of, they basically, in many ways, there was an institutional crisis in uh, Japan in terms of the fact that um, uh, the, the political parties were considered corrupt in very close connection with big business. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there were, a, uh, there were uh, limited opportunities for, there wasn't a lot of opportunities for regular people to rise in, in politics or in the government. So um, there was a sense that it was a kind of corrupted or, or illegit illegitimate system in many ways. But the places okay. that were untainted in many ways were um, the military itself and the, the imperial house. So I, th I think the goal of many of these officers were to purify the political system mm. and create a system where the military was more um, in, in control with the, in tandem with the emperor. And even though this isn't a very realistic kind of system, that was their goal to create a kind of Showa. This is called the Showa period because the um, era name of the emperor 
at the time was Shoa. So they wanted to create a kind of Shoa restoration, which would supposedly restore the emperor to power unencumbered by the um, by his corrupt advisors. So that was the kind of idea they, they so, had. So Taro, I mean, this, this just jumps out at me. Um, the insurrection, uh, such as it was organized, the one that occurred in the United States this month, there, I, I don't know if I could call it emperor worship, but their dedication, their belief, uh, their allegiance to Trump was remarkable. Basically, the cause for the uh, invasion of the Capitol building was uh, what they felt was a lost election. So I, I find it interesting that uh, these Japanese military members were doing this because they thought it was best for the country and they were focusing on the emperor and the U.S. potential parallel here is that the insurrectionists, the seditionists, I guess you can call them, uh, felt that the election was not done in a fair way, that it was a fraud and therefore they wanted to protect and encourage or support the extension of the Trump presidency. So there was kind of like an emperor worship of a sort going on in the United States. I, I had not thought about that before, but now that you mentioned that, that's interesting. So um, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, that's a very in, that's a very interesting parallel. Um, I guess the main difference I would I would say is that um, Trump was there in the case of uh, the U.S. and Trump. Uh, the, his supporters are interested very much in him as a character, uh, as a person, and very inspired by his own um, statements and words. Whereas the emperor was seen as more a kind of distant, abstract figure, mm. and they weren't so much interested in him as an individual. So even if even if this coup took place against his will, they wanted to use his uh, position or his office as a kind of um, to raise the status of that. So he, they weren't as interested in him as an individual. Wasn't it true at the time that uh, he was still, the emperor was considered to be descended from God? Would, would that be a part of the reason why they, they felt that they couldn't directly support him, but more indirectly? Because he was so high level that it's, it would be disrespectful if they actually did something directly to support them, to support the emperor. Is, is that right? Um, yes, uh, he, there was this idea that he was descended um, from the gods and he himself was um, divine in many ways. So, so in that sense, I guess, the, as you're saying, they wouldn't really relate to him as an ordinary political figure or an ordinary person. Right. Although, Taro, there, there are elements of the Trump support that are religious as well. Uh, there are some evangelical Christians Christian nationalists, I guess, who, who do believe that Trump, even though he's not religious in any traditional sense whatsoever, he doesn't go to church or talk about God that much, but uh, for whatever reason, there are elements of his support group that consider him to be uh, divine in some, some way. It's not a majority, but it is a minority. Just, just uh, there is a parallel there a little bit. Um, so let's, let's, for our audience, um, there were a series of five different coups that occurred over the 1930s. Why don't, if you don't mind, can you illustrate one of them so our, our viewers can understand how this actually happened and what the repercussions were, if any, from the coup? Uh, sure. Um, the one I find to be the most uh, significant and um, consequential is the um, is the coup of uh, February 26th, uh, 1936. Mm -hmm. um, it was the last one mentioned in the piece. And um, in this case, the, uh, there, was a, there was a group of officers who led uh, a mutiny within the Japanese army. So it was the first infantry division of the Japanese army. And they led uh, a mutiny where they uh, took over several government buildings, including the war ministry, uh, the Tokyo Police Department. And um, they also went, targeted some politicians' homes and uh, they, they targeted the Imperial Palace itself, although they were not able to take that over. And as a result of this, they, um, they uh, assassinated several 
top political leaders, including two former prime ministers. They tried to assassinate the, the, uh, the prime minister at the time, but they killed his brother instead by mistake, and he was hiding in a part of his house. So he managed to survive, but, um, but they assassinated several important leaders. And there was a kind of standoff between the rest of the army and this, this uh, breakaway division that, um, that had took over uh, for these, these important buildings in Tokyo. And so their goals were very much to eliminate, eliminate the sort of corrupt establishment politicians and leaders and to create this Showa restoration, which I talked about, and kind of take control of the emperor and set up a kind of military dictatorship. Mm. But, um, How did it turn were, out? Uh, it, it, in, in terms of the coup itself, it failed because um, the rest of the military, the senior leadership and the rest of the army did not go along with their plan. So um, I think that's one important aspect of this of these coups in the in Japan in the 1930s that the army and the military was very divided between this very radical um, uh, fanatical uh, anti-establishment division and a more establishment uh, military industrial complex focused uh, side of the military so there was a tension between that and eventually the more establishment part of the military to control and the emperor himself was very outraged by this attempted coup and was very uh, adamant in having the people punished who who instigated this so they so they were um surrounded and and stopped and then eventually arrested and there was a trial several months later um of many of these leaders and 17 of the leaders were uh executed for their role um so it, but it was a, the reason it was important was it was a much bigger scale than any of the attempted coups that had happened before. So yeah, so let's, let's address that. Why were, why didn't the government respond in the way that you described for this 1936 coup to the first coup? There were five in a row. And I read in the article that some of the leaders of the, of coups who, that failed would then start another coup. So they weren't executed in, as in the case that you just described, the last one in 1936. Um, why didn't the emperor and the established military just shut this off the first time it happened? Why did it happen again and again and again? I think um, it's because, uh, well, first of all, they're much smaller in scale. And um, I don't think it got to the attention and to the, um, it got sort of raised the alarm bells of the emperor and his people to the same extent. And so it was sort of more considered an internal military control issue um, of, the, of the top levels of the military controlling their kind of uh, more uh, rebellious officers. And so since there weren't as big consequences and um, uh, it was sort of considered a more uh, internal military issue uh, that's why it wasn't suppressed to the same extent. And it takes time for, I guess, the buildup of these things led to, um, and the bigger scale of this last event led to a stronger response, especially since the emperor and his closest advisors were so um, determined to punish the, the instigators. Yeah. I think one thing I picked up too in your article along these lines is that uh, in the earlier coups, I, they were smaller scale, as you pointed out. But also, there was a sense that uh, these these junior military officers they shouldn't be doing this. But it's because of their excessive patriotism, uh, their their Japanese spirit, or they're they're trying to purify. That there was some sense of not punishing them. That, that this was just a a mistake and over exuberance, right? So, did you? Is that right? Is that impression that I read about in the article? Would you agree that there was a kind of a sense of forgivingness of these earlier coups? Well, these are rural soldiers, and they're they're. I understand why they're doing this, but uh, you know it's wrong. But we're not going to punish them, and therefore they could do it again. 
in, in the end, that's what happened. They ended up running a, a, a next coup and a next coup and a next coup until it culminated in this big one at the end, like you mentioned. I think I think there was that sense, and um, um, I'm not sure how large a percent of the population felt that way, but there definitely was a, a significant strain in the Japanese population that supported the military, respected it very highly, and mm. supported um, military ventures in outside Japan, sort of imperialistic ventures. Because another aspect of this, which isn't talked about in the article, is that while these coups were happening in Japan, there were also cases of military um, insubordination outside of Japan where the military, the Japanese military was stationed, like the most famously the Manchurian incident where um, oh, yeah. the officers blew up a part of the Manchurian railway and used that as a pretext to take over Manchuria, which led Japan to um, come into conflict with the League of Nations and eventually leave the League of Nations. So, oh my, this, yeah. so as these things were going on within Japan, um, there are these cases of ins insubordination outside as well. And this, a lot of, a big part of the population was very um, uh, excited about Japan's ventures in Manchuria and later would be excited about Japan's war in, in China from 1937. So I think there was significant popular support and um, I see. support in the media and other cases as well. Okay. All right. So, yeah, the context of my question was within the military and uh, the elite leadership. But your answer, I think, is interesting. More generally, the Japanese population didn't consider these coups as being uh, significantly bad. It, it was in a sense that they supported the military's expansion of power and growth. Now, this, this, this uh, 1936 uh, coup ended up with a hundred some odd people being arrested and 17 being executed. So it failed in that sense. But as we all know, uh, Japan did become a military, militarily led, emperor focused, totalitarian, would you say? I mean, or is that too extreme? It was, uh, Japan was still a democracy, I guess, but it led to w what the coup members wanted to achieve, even though their coups failed, ended up happening. Japan as a country, as a nation, became led by the emperor and led by the military. Is that correct? To some extent. Um, I think uh, the article says that uh, um, eventually their goals were, even though the coup was suppressed, their goals were realized anyway. Um, to some extent, I think that's the case. The military's influence grew. But I think I'd, I'd like to um, sort of point out that it was a kind of it was a different faction of the military than the people who led led the coup so the people who led the coup wanted pretty much very sweeping system systemic change they were even in some sense crit critics of capitalism they want they wanted a kind of system where um, there was more state management or control of the economy despite the fact that they were um, very anti-communist they wanted some uh, state more state control, but the more establishment wing of the military uh, took control. And what's interesting is that it wasn't that they took control as a coup, they took it more as a gradual slide towards their control because they were given the task of containing these radical elements within the military. So it was a kind of, in some sense, unintended consequence, you, you might say. All right, as, as is so often in the case of history or all of our human activity. So we just have a few minutes left, Otto, but uh, I want to conclude by, by thinking about what, what lessons can we take from what we just talked about, your illustration of these coups. Uh, the article makes the point that these series of coups occurred because there wasn't a strict response to the earlier ones until we finally got to 1936. So. Uh, the one conclusion is that the United States now, in looking at this, should very, very strongly find out who was behind this, because it does seem to be an organized effort, even though the video, when we all watched it in early January, was chaotic. But it does seem to be organized and planned. So whoever organized this needs to be uh, 
arrested. And that would include the protesters and also government officials that may have been tacitly supporting them. And, and then, of course, leading to the president, who, in a sense, incited all of this by making up the fake issue of, of fraud in the election. So uh, would you agree with that conclusion that, that looking at what happened in Japan, should the United States, in order to ensure that this doesn't happen again, because I guess if we look at Japan, this could happen again in, in, in the United States if the response is not handled properly. Yeah, I, I agree that um, there should be a sort of definite response and consequences to these sorts of things, um, these kinds of insurrections or break-ins to, uh, or yeah, insurrections. And, uh, but I think also what's important is to address the root causes or the institutional causes of this of the of this kind of sentiment that leads to the coup, mm. so socioeconomic causes as well as institutional sort of problems in the system that can lead to this. So in Japan's case, it would be weak civilian control of the military was something that needed to be addressed to um, solve it. So and then another thing is to be careful about limiting civil liber liberties or restricting democracy in the name of preventing these things because it can turn around and create a undemocratic system at all in, in general, which sort of enables the cause that it's trying to prevent, which happened in Japan with the military gradually gaining more and more control to, for the main purpose of creating more order and security in Japan. So those are, those are some lessons that I took from it. Yeah, that, that's interesting. And that debate actually has begun in the United States now about changing the laws so that the, the uh, arrest and persecution of the criminals who, who invaded the Capitol building can actually be carried out. Um, the FBI is saying that the international terrorism laws are very, very strong, but domestic terrorism laws are not. And then it brings up the whole civil liberties issue that you just addressed. Well, we have run out of time. I, I told you that when we did this, the, the half hour would go by so quickly. So thank you so much for being my guest on the show and helping us to understand what happened in the 1930s Japan and also how that potentially can in, inform the United States to handle our coup in a, a way to prevent them from occurring again in the future. So thank you so much. and. Uh, if in the unfortunate case that there's a second coup in the United States, I'm going to call you again and have you on the show again. Thank you very much. Yep. All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you for uh, viewing our show, and I'll see you all in two weeks. We'll have a different subject to cover at that time. Thank you very much. Aloha, everyone.